Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Only Land Fan Show. My name is Kendall Lejeune, and our guest today is Jack Bosch. Jack Bosch is the co-founder of the Land Profit Generator Method and the Land Profit Coaching Program with his wife, Michelle Bosch. The Land Profit Generator Method is the premier incubator of real estate investing and better known as the Harvard of land flipping. Jack is a respected industry leader, speaker, educator, and perhaps most importantly, a parent and husband. Michelle and Jack have done over 4,500 land flips and over time also converted the flipping income into generational wealth through other real estate investments. The simple little known land profit generator method real estate niche has provided thousands of people with the opportunity to get into the real estate game without the hassles of traditional real estate investing. And Jack and Michelle continue to spread the message with the mission to create 10,000 millionaires and impact the lives of many more. Jack, thank you so much for joining us. How are you? I'm doing great. Sorry, I had to unmute myself. I'm doing fantastic. How are you? Thank you for having me, Kendall. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining. So glad that you're with us. I'm doing really well. I'm glad you're doing well. I think everyone's doing well. We're all very happy to have you. I can't tell you how many people have messaged me so excited that we're going to have the one and only Jack Bosch on the show today. So thank you so much again for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yeah. Great. Absolutely. I'm, I'm excited to talk about land. It looks like you guys are all fans of land, so that's even better. So <laughs> I'm, I found here a new, a, a new, a new room of uh, like-minded people. Absolutely love it. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, the first thing that I want to do is just get started with, can you talk us through how you got started in doing land deals? What is your background <laughs> in land? Yeah, so the, so the backstory is we've been doing land deals for now 22 years or so. And, uh, and, but we, uh, we got started, obviously you can tell by my accent, I'm or not, or not originally from here, I'm from Germany. Michelle's from Honduras, Central America. We got started because uh, we wanted to get into real estate. We, we looked at real estate as the way to get out of the corporate grind. And, uh, and through a bunch of trial and error, we came across tax liens and tax deed investment. And, and actually through that, we stumbled into land because Basically, we couldn't make tax lien and tax lien and deed investing working. I mean, of course it works. Every real estate method works if you get it, if you find the right angle to it and so on. But in our case, I think we both had jobs. Michelle ended up, we ended up sending her to a tax deed auction in California. And anything that we could afford to buy was land. So they went to an auction, but it was a very competitive auction. Everyone bit these properties up to the wazoo. And she came basically back very disappointed that we couldn't get anything. So then uh, shortly after, um, we, we basically, after failing and failing, and then we have bought some tax liens in Arizona, which is in a, land, a tax lien state. And I live in Arizona, we live in Arizona and still do, already back then did. Um, we bought some liens, but then also the cheapest liens we could find was on land. And, uh, and then those were redeemed three weeks later and we made like $3 in, in interest. So it was like, well, that's not the way to pursue. But then essentially we, we, the concept that there's people who absolutely don't want their properties anymore to the degree that they're literally just willing to let them go to tax sale was a mind blowing concept to us. Because we coming from Europe, the laws are different. The way is different. Germans are they kind of wired different. I don't think any German would ever let go of a property like that. They would rather they would they would find some way to sell it somewhere. But uh, also the laws are different. You don't actually lose the property to non-payment of property taxes in Europe. You just get liens and liens and liens. And eventually, I think when you die, then the property might go to the state or some other way. Or when eventually, fifty years later, somebody wants to sell a property, they have to be paid off. Bottom line, though, is this in the United States is like the wild, wild west, where if you don't pay property taxes within a few years, they take the property away from you. So, but we saw it from the other hand. We're like, man, there's people who don't want their property anymore so much that they're willing to let it go. And then we had a thought. And the thought was very simply, what if we contact these people before their properties go to auction? So first, what we did is we started getting the list from the auction of what's coming up six weeks or four to six weeks later. And we sent those a few letters, but then we were pressured in time because if we got these deals and we had to flip them before, uh, be before we would get them, we would have to pay them off before. So otherwise they go to auction. 
So we, we thought about that, but then we had an even better thought, which is how about we go to the county back at the time, now you can go to data services and you see if we can get a list of every owner who hasn't paid their property taxes, whether it's be for a week or a month or a year or three years or five years or, or whatever, or for eternity, whatever it is. So we got that list. It was that back in the day, it's not easy to obtain those lists. And then we sent some letters out and not just to, to landowners. We did that for every kind of property. We were not yet focusing on land, but only landowners responded when we sent them a letter. Homeowners would not respond, but only landowners responded. And at that moment, we are like, well, what do we do now? And because again, we had no real estate experience. So we basically figured out, we played it safe. And the first deal we got accepted was a about eight to $10,000 lot in a small community in Arizona, a few hours away from Phoenix. And we made this guy a $400 offer for it because we figured, hey, what the heck? Uh, like in worst case, we lose $400. We can stomach that. But, but if we get it, we can perhaps sell it for a little bit more. And the guy accepted. It was a, the case of a divorce, a case of where the guy wanted to move out of state. He just didn't care about the property anymore. Uh, it reminded him of his ex-spouse because they had plans to build something there initially. And so it has nothing to do with the property that he gave it up so cheap. It really had only had to do with him um, with him having like negative emotions towards the property. And so he sold it to us and we went up there, put a sign on the property and the neighbor bought it right on the spot from us for $4,000, which is not the greatest fortune in the world. It's a $3,600 profit, but it's 10X profits. And it really changed our outlook. And then the next two weeks later, we found another tax delinquent property for 500 bucks. That was a, that we then 40 acres for 500 bucks that we sold for $10,000 out of all places on ebay.com. We just put it on eBay and sold it. And, uh, and after five, six deals like that, all land deals, we're like, you know what? Forget about houses. Let's put the blinders on. Let's just do only land because we don't even have to know much about real estate uh, in order to get them. We only need to figure out how to find these owners, how to get uh, them on, how to value those properties, how to find their estimated market value and the rest. I mean, we don't have to touch them. We don't even have to go see them. And then from that, we then shortly after, about a year into it, we, we realized that there is probably 100 times more properties where the owners still pay property, pay property taxes. So there's 100 times more owners where the owner, more, let me say that. There's, there's probably, a, there's for sure, at least 100, if not more times more properties where the owners still pay the property taxes, but they no longer want those properties. So we forgot about the tax delinquent, which was a nightmare to get those lists anyway. And now we're going after uh, any kind of land, typically absentee owners and things like that. And then we just scaled that thing. And uh, now we've done thousands of deals. That is incredible. So in a sense, it sounds like land found you, right? Like you were looking for yes, something yeah. and land found yeah. you. That's incredible. We had no intentions of land. I mean, how could you have any? Intent? Back in this 20, 22 years ago, there were perhaps five people in the country doing what we do right now, what we do now. Now we are teaching it. We have been teaching it for 15 years. And now there's there's a, a lot more people. Perhaps a couple of you guys have perhaps come across us before, or learned from us. I don't know. I hope so. Uh, and uh, so so now there's many more people doing it, but still nothing compared to houses. But but back then there was nobody to learn from there. And you don't, nobody ever woke up, I would say thinking, let me just flip land, right? That's just <laughs> not something that comes natural. You got to stumble into it somehow. Got it. So what types of deals do you specialize in? Like, I know that you said you have a pretty wide net, um, but is it infill lots? Is it large land acreage? Is it subdivisions? What type of deals would you say you specialize in? So we have, uh, we typically specialize on three kinds of properties. And personally, in our own business, we focus mostly on two of them. Uh, and, uh, but the three kind of properties that we generally speaking deal with is number one, infill lots. They're not as frequent as, as the other two lots. So when they come along, I take them. And when we, when we get into an area where we can get a few, we'll, we'll happily grab them and, and, and flip them. But um, they're a little bit less predictable than the other two. So therefore, I want to call our bread and butter the other two, which is what we call the path of growth. Uh, and basically outside of larger cities, let's say anywhere between like five miles and perhaps 75 miles outside of a large city. Now the 75 miles sounds like a long distance, but if you have a city like Atlanta, Georgia, if you're 75 miles out of downtown Atlanta, you're still in the suburbs. 
right? So if you look at uh, large cities like that, so um, basically those kind of properties we found, we, we find they're, they're selling very, very quickly because even if they're a little bit further outside, because they're attractive to multiple kinds of buyers. And that's kind of how we designed our business. We don't just pick up whatever comes our way. We go specifically for certain kinds of properties that we know have high demand. And of course, the infill lots have high demand by builders. If you, even, even today, builders are buying land, particularly if you can get that to them at a discounted price. Uh, the second thing, uh, these, these, these path of growth properties, they're basically attracted to, if they're very close to the city, they're attracted to financial, financial buyers, as we call them. Basically, people that, that have money and that instead of putting the money in the stock market goes up and down and up and down, they put it out there into the path of growth where, where they know that if the city, let's say, expands and continues to expand, let's take again Atlanta, Georgia, it's one of the fastest growing metro areas in the country. So it always goes, there's always a new development being built. So if that city goes and expands by, let's say, a quarter mile a year, and you get a property that's, or half a mile a year, you get a property that's five miles outside of that of the current last development, you can pretty much say that within 20 years, that property that you're just buying, that this person is buying, is right smack at the corner of the city. So in that way, if that's a 10-acre parcel that today perhaps is worth 100 grand and, um, or 200 grand, and we get it for 80 and we sell it to that person for 130. So we make a $50,000 profit. They get it at 70 cents on a dollar. They're happy. They're just parking their money there. And in 20 years from now, that property is probably worth half a million dollars an acre, not infl inflation adjusted, not in today's money. Obviously, in 20 years, that's probably going to be worth $20 million. But with inflation, that's the same as whatever, $10 million today. So they're very, very happy parking their money there and just waiting 10, 15, 20 years for the market value to go up. That's number one. Number two, we love selling to future retirees because we really feel like we're providing a service to humanity with that service to, because in the United States, so I think over 60% of all people don't have more than $400 in their bank account, period. So they're one broken car down, one broken car away from being completely broke. They're one, one medical bill away from being completely broke. And, uh, and a lot of those are in their 50s. As a matter of fact, I think the number is over 70% of all 50 plus year old people in the United States don't have more than a few thousand all saved up. Wow. And, if, and that's, a sad, that's a very, very sad statistic. But what are those people are going to do when they hit retirement age, when they retire? If they have a $1,500 Social Security and their rents are $1,500, they can't live in a city. So that's a lot true. of people, especially those that are like aging out of the workforce right now, that they basically realize that. And when some just decide to work forever, some decide to learn land flipping, which are the smart ones. And, but then also some and quite a few basically say, well, if I can't retire in the city, I got to go outside of the city where perhaps I can buy a piece of land today, pay it off over the next 10 years in, in installment sales, and then put perhaps a mobile home on there. And now I have a, perhaps if I need to go to the city, to my doctor, to the pharmacy, to the ballpark, or to, to just enjoy dinner, I can because it's a 20, 30, 40 minute drive. But at the same time, I'm somewhere, uh, I'm close to the city, but I'm in a way lower, lower cost of living kind of space. So they take a $25,000 lot from us that we perhaps get under contract for $4,000. We flip it to them for $20,000 with seller financing with $250 a month for 10 years or something like that. And they, they, buy, they buy it, they pay it off while they still have a job, while they still have income. And then at the end, they perhaps get a used mobile home, put it on there, and they have a dignified retirement at that point because they have a paid off, paid off house, a paid off lot, perhaps with a paid off mobile home. And now they have $1,500 in social security to actually live on. And that's, that's just a great place for them to be. And then the third kind of group of people that buys those kind of lots is uh, typically what we call, what we actually currently call the COVID buyers. And the COVID buyers are really people like you and I, people in all age groups, but that now can work remotely. Still over 49% of all Americans work from home. Wow. 49%, just read the statistics two weeks ago. That's gonna go down probably a little bit more, but I don't think it's gonna go down below 35, 40%.
So let's say a third of all Americans, there's over 160 million working Americans. That means there's over 50 million people, almost like 60 million people in the United States that can work from anywhere they want to be. They work, can work anywhere and uh, can live anywhere and work anywhere. Those 50, 60 million people, not all of them want to live in a cookie cutter home and it's not in, this, in their neighborhood on a postage side slot where if the neighbor coughs, they, hurt, they hear it. Some of them want, they want land, some of them want acreage, and some of them want, they're, they're buying two, three acres, five acres, 10 acres in the vicinity of town of a bigger city. And then they're spending a few years building a house there, they're moving in and they're getting a horse and they're getting a goat and they're getting chickens and they're like, liking that kind of stuff. So this is the third kind of uh, buyer for that property. And then, of course, we have the third kind of property, which is the recreational area, which is interesting for just the fun-loving RV people. Since COVID, COVID has really changed the fabric of the United States. Right. COVID has, people, has made people question their life and really reprioritize of what's important in life. And, um, and a lot of people have realized that, that fun is important. Like there's a reason why Louis Vuitton, all those companies have stellar years after year after year. Why the why the 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 the, the owner, or the CEO, or the of the of the company behind those luxury companies is now, I think, currently the richest man in the world, or at least uh, amongst the top two, three, right? And that is because people have, whether smart or not, have decided that hey, if I'm uh, if I'm working all that hard all the time for the man, is might not be the right answer. So instead they are now enjoying more. And the recreational land is part of that. RV sales are off the hook, like ATV sales are off the charts. And so people buy that stuff and then enjoy their weekends out there. Plus also right now with the, with the Ukraine war and us really being in World War III, just through a proxy war with, uh, with uh, Ukraine is, uh, and, and, and Russia kind of uh, eliminating or like putting on, on, on ice that kind of nuclear kind of agreement. There's a lot of people that they call doomsday preppers they want to buy these properties and, and so on. So, so that's basically in a nutshell what we, what we focus on. Yeah, that's absolutely incredible. I love that you are really thinking about what the, who the end buyer is going to be and then making sure that, you, that that is what's guiding your acquisitions and, and what types of properties you're going after. So yeah. you did mention uh, seller financing. So do you sell all of your properties on seller financing or how, which deals do you decide to use that as an exit strategy? So that's a, that's a great question. So um, when we in our business are in the blessed situation, obviously, that we have made millions of dollars, if I may say so, and we have good financial resources, so we and have we have for years offered every single property that we have either for cash or seller financing we let the buyers choose we do not have certain properties that we will only sell cash and there's certain properties we only sell self financing it doesn't matter to us even if we have a property under contract for $100,000 and uh, we're selling it for 150 and they want to buy it with seller financing and only put $30,000 down we'll still take that seller financing deal because if you look at that deal if we, uh, perhaps I can quickly use my whiteboard for that. Uh, if you don't mind, I have my fancy whiteboard. I want to use it. Yeah, let's uh, do it. Right? Okay, so basically, if, if, if we have a deal on a contract for 100K, and uh, this is the contract, and we go sell it for 150K, right? In this case, we have, um, and then and the buyer only buys it for 150, right? But only puts 30K down. Then therefore, we have a note that is what? $120,000 a uh, $120,000 note, right? So in that case, that's great, but um, we only have received $30,000 back of the $100,000 we have. So that means we really have still $70,000 in that deal, right? Now, most people can't do that. We are in a blessed situation that we can. So what we do in this case, we take, we take that all day long because on the $120,000 note, the monthly payment, the monthly payment here, Oh, that's supposed to be a P. The monthly payment, actually, let me undo this. The monthly payment here is probably going to be something like $1,500 a month. So if I get $1,500 a month, that's $18,000 a year. If I get $18,000 a year, like 18K a year, on basically a cash outlay of 70%, that's a 25% return on my investment every single year on the 70K that I have here. And if I have the 70K spare money laying around anyway, right? if I have the $70,000 spare money, or, uh, uh, not spare money, but if I have 
the financial means that it otherwise just sits in the bank account, then I'll gladly take a 25% return on that money. Alternatively, of course, I could also take that note and sell that note, sell that note, can probably sell that note for $100,000. And then I still make a $30,000 cash profit. And actually, when we teach this, we actually, we call this a triple close. We actually all have, also have note buyers and, and, and lenders and things in our universe that, uh, that you can actually do the deal such that you're buying it for, for 100, you're selling it for 150, and you're selling the note all the same day so that you get uh, $30,000. I was like, like, not as a double close, using, doing a closing without your money, but a triple close, buying the property, selling the property, and selling the note all without using your own money, all, all without using any of your money, uh, all in the same day. So, so, but typically we do those deals, even if it's a deal like that, we're fine with it. Most of our students can't be fine with it because they don't just have $70,000 laying around. So, so therefore, um, in that case, that's where the triple close comes in that you basically sell the note right away. That is fantastic because you actually read my mind because I was about to ask you, what would you say to people that don't have the 70K just laying around to be able to fully buy that property? And so I love that idea of that you, uh, that you line up that note buyer as well as part of that, so you can actually use that to, to close on the first transaction. That is absolutely brilliant. I love that. So, yeah, we, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, no, no. I was just going to ask um, in terms of uh, where the market is going. Obviously, there's there's a lot of talk about shifts in the market and and the market is changing obviously i think if you've been in this business long enough you can kind of see the patterns right as they kind of reveal themselves so where do you see the market going now and what do you do or what do you plan to do in your business to make sure that you're thriving to it to adjust to that market shift okay so in we have done this since 2002 and obviously in 2008 and 2011 there was a huge market shift happening right prices of real estate in some markets went down 80 percent during that time uh, so obviously land also went down in value in some cases 50 60 70 percent uh, i don't think i've seen it going down 80 percent but uh, but it, it cut in half or 60 70 percent we've seen that in some areas so what happens in a shifting market? Well, first of all, let me address, I personally don't necessarily, don't think, actually not necessarily, I personally don't think we are going to see anything like that in the land market right now because of what I just explained. Because we're having, we're literally, we're having two major forces that actually speak in favor of land being and staying hot. Number one is exactly what I talked about, those, the virtualization of this world. Like people now can live where they want and not everyone wants to live in a cookie cutter home in the suburbs. Not everyone wants to live in a high rise. People want space. COVID has changed the fabric of the way we live. And I think these are sustainable trends. Number two, uh, Elon Musk uh, created, uh, what's it called? Uh, Starlink, started Starlink. And Starlink is basically a satellite um, internet service. Now a satellite internet service existed before it was freaking expensive. And now it's starting to become coming down in price. It's still expensive, my understanding is, but it's starting to become affordable. So one of our coaches, or actually two of our coaches, they live a lot outside of town. They got Starlink, and that's how they how they stay connected. But what that really means is that with Starlink, with Elon Musk having put satellites all over the U.S. and probably over time all over the world, and probably already to some degree, now there is, and and this continues to happen. Over the next five years, there's going to be literally connectivity, high speed or reasonable high speed kind of internet connectivity anywhere you want to be in the entire globe. And if it's just restricted to the United States, anywhere in the United States, if you look at the size of the United States and the population density in the United States, the United States, like I'm from Germany, for the United States, and there's still, still a lot of green areas in Germany, but for, for the United States to have the same population density of Germany, United States would have to have 1 billion people. So in other words, the United States is two thirds empty, like two thirds empty. And I tried to go, go try to drive from, from, I don't know, to 
from Albuquerque to LA or so. There's like barely a, a soul you see. It's just all desert and it's all thing. And, and the same thing we drove one time from Chicago to Phoenix when we moved down here. It's about like 15 hours just going through just greenery and, 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 and pastures and then desert, right? So the thing is all of that land is right up until now, if you wanted to move out there, you and, and you're still in your working uh, working age and you needed internet and cell phone connectivity, you were screwed. You couldn't do it, but now you can. So it opens up all of these territories, all of these areas for settlement really from people for people that want more space. So those are two things that are converging right now that will allow uh, will allow masses of people to move really where they want to move. And uh, you don't have to be in the city anymore to have cell phone reception. You don't have to be in the city anymore to have uh, internet access. So that's a big, big deal, particularly now when you take that and, and when you combine that with, uh, with, with all of a sudden 40% of the people working from home. So that's, that, those are the two of the big reasons. The second thing I think uh, is that, uh, that I don't, so those things are gonna keep, keep land really, really sexy. The second thing though is that um, even in 2008 and nine, what happens is that what happened is that land is what uh, land the way we probably deal with it, which is usually the land worth between ten thousand and a few hundred thousand dollars that you sell to a uh, it's it's B two C right it's business to consumer you're the business selling your land to a consumer it's not B two B you're selling it to a developer you know you're not selling it to a land uh, we're not doing land development here we're not doing land banking here we're doing land flipping land wholesaling land seller financing. We are selling the way we do this, we sell this to the end consumer. And the end consumer is only going to start paying less for the land when they feel the effects of a big recession. So land is actually, that kind of land that we're talking about is a lagging indicator to the economy. So versus the big development land is a leading indicator to the economy. So the big developers, the big Toll Brothers, the KD Homes and so on, they stop buying land the moment they start seeing that the, that, the, that the traffic flow to their model home starts going down, which is about nine months before a recession even hits. So the moment people start not buying these houses that much anymore, they're realizing they have alarm flags go on and they start canceling and stopping to buy those big tracks of multi-million dollars. Absolutely. Well. Our buyers don't. Our buyers continue buying through all of that, and they only uh, they only buy less or differently, if I may say so. Uh, once the economy has kind of like has, is in a recession, once people are losing their jobs, and once they start realizing they don't have much more money in their pocket, so we are like usually about a year, now eight months to a year behind a recession. Well, this is the weirdest recession that I've ever seen because it's a recession where the economy is still growing and where the economy is still adding 500,000 employees every kind of month or quarter or something like that. Like everyone's saying we're in a recession, but really the malls are full, the restaurants are full, uh, the people are still spending money and, uh, and every employment report comes out better than the next one before. So I'm like completely confused by this economy, but I know one thing, we haven't seen any, any slowdown yet in land. Now, here's the thing. We have seen a big slowdown. And the slowdown we've seen was in 2009, 10, and 11. But there wasn't a slowdown. It was a shift. What happens in that environment, and sorry, I'm going like on a big tangent here to answer your question, but this I is great. figured a little this bit of the background is, is, is helpful because we have seen so much stuff in 22 years that um, the, main, the main answer to your question is, if we indeed see a big decline in house prices and therefore in land and, and, and also in land prices, which for the reasons I just mentioned, I don't think we will see. But if we really will see that, then here's what's going to happen. The bottom falls in a true in a true recession where the land prices go down, the bottom falls out of the bottom end properties. So in that environment, do not do any deals more anymore for deal for prop with properties that are worth less than ten thousand dollars. So if you've been taught to do ten thousand dollar deals. Forget about those. They will not sell anymore. And here's the reason why. Unfortunately, the below $10,000 properties are attractive only to the people who can't afford anything else. And those are unfortunately the people that first lose their jobs. And that's just sad truth. Like in a recession, the rich don't lose much money. 
It's the working class, the lower working class, the lower, the lower uh, income class that loses their jobs and that loses the most. And they can't even afford those anymore. So the demand for those in 2009, 10, and 11 went through the floor. They just did not sell anymore, those cheaper ones. So what you need to do if that really happens, you need to go up market. You need to go higher end properties. And what also what's going to happen is you need to say there's going to be a big shift towards seller financing properties. So before 2007, we would sell 70% of our properties cash and 30% seller financing. Ah, as soon as the recession or like nine months after the recession hit and land started being affected, uh, at that point, it switched to 70% seller financing or even 80% seller financing and 20% 20 uh, 20 cash. To me, that's not a bad thing. I love the cash flow from these properties. But if, again, if you're if, if one of our students who are down, who by that time, we, we were already making $71,000 a month in cash flow from the land that we had built, that we have sold in seller financing up to that point. We had already made millions of dollars in land flipping. So when we sw switched to sell almost everything with less seller financing, our cash flow went even up during that time. Right? So it was a beautiful thing. We, we actually, we, we cruised to the, last, uh, to the last recession because land flipping itself continued working just that you needed to adjust. The prices were lower, yes. There was a little time period because the, the decline, that did happen. The prices did go down where we had to cancel a few contracts or renegotiate the contracts. And then once it settled, we, were, we just bought cheaper and sold cheaper. Our margins were smaller. Instead of buying something for 10 grand, selling it for 50, or buying it for 20 and selling it for 50, we would buy it for eight and sell it for 25. So the margins are smaller. We still made plenty of money, but more than anything, we converted it into cash flow, and that's and that's a beautiful thing. But if you're now as a student, let's say you don't have millions of dollars sitting in a bank account at that point, you need to start selling notes. You need to start creating those notes such that you can sell them, and that's where that's where this example comes in that you could sell the note and do what's called a triple close. That is absolutely incredible insight. So. If someone's listening to this and they say, okay, I, I get the fact that I need to um, start selling notes. Maybe they've never sold a note before. They've never structured a note. Do you have any rules of thumb uh, as far as what you like to see in terms of seller financing? I mean, I'm sure there are home run uh, seller financing terms, but what types of things do you like to keep in mind when thinking about creating a note that's going to work on a property? So the first thing you want to do when uh, selling a note is uh, you you want to identify there's there's sure, particularly if you start out without having a big cash cushion like when we started out when we started out we started we started this business with a few thousand dollars to our name so when we started selling property when selling properties with self financing uh, we very clearly did, did separated different properties we had. If we buy a property, if we bought a property for 10 cents on the dollar, or let's say below 20 cents on the dollar, that was a clear, great candidate to sell with seller financing. And if we bought a property more like in the 40, 50% market of market value, that was a clear candidate for a quick cash wholesale. And yeah. you can still do that again, because I don't think there's, I don't expect a, a decline to come. I don't expect a big crash to come, right? Because the economy might be slowing, and uh, and so on, but we have these other uh, these other big drivers here that that drive land. But uh, so you can separate it number one by by the kind of property. If I use my white fork again, so if you have a fifty thousand dollar if you have a fifty thousand dollar property, right? That's the market value, market value, uh, market value, and you get that property for ten k, right? This is the value here, and this is the contract price. If you get it for 10K, well, that's a no-brainer to sell with self-financing because you might take this property and put it on the market for 40K, like just discount it a little bit with 20% down and you get 8K down. So with 8K down, well, sorry, not 80, but uh, let's see, 8K down, you get an $8,000 down payment. And actually that's supposed to be, let me make it, this a prettier eight, there we go. Uh, you make an, an $8,000 down payment. You don't get all your money back. You still have 2K. You still have a cash outlay of 2K, but most people can do a cash outlay of 2K, particularly now if you then add a monthly payment of $400 a month, right? It takes you five months and you got your $2,000 back on that property. So right. I'm okay with that. So we put for ourselves a rule of thumb 
that we like to do these things in a way that even if we don't get all our money back right away when, from the down payment, as long as we get our money back within a year, year and a half, we're fine. And that was initially, right? Because then, then we, can, we can replenish our source of funds fairly quickly. And in this case, it would be five months because four times four, five times $400 is $2,000. You have your $2,000 back here. So we, that's, that's kind of how we looked at it um, from, from that thing. Now, at the same time though, if you, get a, if you get a property that's worth, uh, let's say again, uh, the value of the property is worth 50K, if you have to pay, if your contract price is $23,000 for that, well, that's not a good candidate to sell with seller financing because if you get $8,000 or something down back, you're still out $15,000. Right. And $15,000 at $400 a month or $4,800 a year, that's, uh, that's like three and a half years before you have your money back, which is still, by the way, not bad. That's still a 30% return on investment. But if you don't have an extra $15,000 laying around, it's not a good thing. So you're better served just taking this property and just perhaps selling it for $31,000 cash and making an $8,000 uh, $8, K cash profit, right? And uh, cash profit and out of that deal. It's not the world's best profit, but hey, now it, 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 it gives you $8,000 that you now have in the pocket. And then on the next deal, if you go two in the negative with a seller financing deal, well, you got eight to play with. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Basically how we look at that. That's fantastic. And so how do you, whenever you're structuring notes, I know that lots of people have different thoughts about this, but <laughs> how do you go about figuring out um, what my monthly payment's going to be? What is the, the term of the loan? How long um, are, is the loan going to be? What's the interest rate? Um, do you have some, some rules of thumb about that as well? Yeah, so we follow, uh, we, we, I, I can do this in two ways. So the first thing is, particularly if you're looking to sell notes, the note buyers today, at least the ones that are in our environment, because in land, they demand a higher interest rate in land than they demand on houses. So if in houses right now, interest rates are high anyway, but if you have, if somebody, um, if you if your house if you have a house with a, if they can make seven eight percent on a house they're happy usually or I'm I'm not a note buyer myself on houses I don't deal with houses but on land most note buyers that work with us want to make at least twelve if not fourteen fifteen percent on their money usually they want a fifteen percent we we can use you can use as a ballpark they want to make a fifteen percent yield on their investment so yeah. fifteen percent is what they need to do so so therefore. The easiest way to get almost all your money out of a note is by charging 15% to your buyer. Now that sounds like a high number, but really is it? For 22 years now, we have charged 12.9% interest. Even, when, even two years ago or a year ago, when the interest rates for houses were at 2.8%, we charged 12.9% interest. Because very simply, here's the reason why a lender We'll give a lender simply, uh, I mean, let's, let, me, let me use this one more time. Let's say here's a city. Let's say, this is, let's say this is a city, right? And your land is over here. There's, not, there's, there's very few lenders out there. I mean, there is Brad here with us. So we can ask him if he, if he lends on land, what loan to value would you give on a piece of land? I, I don't know, but most lenders that I've been working with uh, that 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 land in the in the land area, they might give a fifty percent loan to value uh, on a piece of land. Now, here's the thing: a bank will never lend on this. A bank will simply not lend on this. At least ninety nine point nine percent of the banks that I've ever met will not lend on this. A bank will lend you perhaps on a loan. Uh, 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 will give you a loan perhaps on a on a lot that's right in the city on a road with all utilities. But even then banks will only give you up to 50% loan to value. So therefore, if we, and then they still are charge a premium interest rate on that land. So as a result, what happens is, um, so, so what is somebody's option when they don't, they can go to a bank and they say like, yeah, I wanna buy, the, I wanna buy these 20 acres over here, or these 10 acres over here, would you give me land? They're laughing back at, they're laughing, laugh that person out of the office. 
So we come and say like, not only will we allow you to pay this off in monthly payments, not only will you give your land loan, we will actually allow you to only give us 20% down on this property. And we will therefore do an 80% loan to value. Now, if a bank would, almost no bank would consider even a 50% and then they perhaps charge them nine or 10%, wouldn't you think that an 80% warrants a 13% interest rate? Sure. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, percent. So, so, so that thing, and perhaps Brad, can you chime in, perhaps for a second? What? Yeah, everything you said is exactly right. Fifty percent is my ceiling. Fifty percent loan to value, and banks hate lending on land unless you're building on it. They don't see dirt as worth anything. Right, exactly right. Unless you have this super strong relationship with them, and you have been growing with them, and they know you have done. 20 developments already, but even then they like you to contribute the land and they give you a, a construction loan on top of the land, but they don't, still don't like to lend on the actual land. Exactly. Yeah, it's crazy out there. So now we give them an 80% loan to value, sometimes even a 90% loan to value. Doesn't that, in, in, in finance, the higher the loan to value, the higher the risk, the higher the risk, the higher interest rate. So charging 15% interest, is absolutely no problem. By the way, you know what? How you know how you can get that, or what happens if somebody doesn't want to pay that? You have the conversation with your buyer, and so like, yes, sir, Mr. You explain that same thing to your buyer. He's like, Mr. Buyer, if this, and they're like, but I still don't want to pay fifteen. Well, there's a simple way you can drop the interest rate. Put more down. Right. <laughs> right? So they yeah. put more down. You drop the interest rate. I have no problem charging only ten percent if they give me fifty percent down, or thirty percent, or forty percent down. So those are things you can play with because you essentially become the bank. So that's the first thing. 15, charge as much as you can. Well, not as much as you can, but 15% sounds like, sounds like a good number. Charge 15% because the note buyers are going to want to have 15%. So if you present to a note buyer a $100,000 note that, that the property behind it is worth, I don't know, $140,000, and... The note itself is a 15% interest rate. They're looking at that and they're like, I'll buy that for hundred grand. At least the note buyers in our universe, uh, they buy this in those cases, so, uh, sometimes for hundred grand because they're getting their yield. They're already, the, the, the loan itself is not at hundred percent loan to value, but perhaps only a 70 or so loan percent loan to value. They're happy with that. So that's, that's one of the most important things to, to sell those notes. I think that was your question, right? Yeah, that's incredible. And how long uh, do you- Oh, that's the other part. Yeah, so there's different ways to skin that cat. The way back in the 2000s, we actually did large land auctions. We actually would buy 250 properties every four months. And then we would do one land auction and we would sell 250 properties all in one day. We would rent a convention center, put 800 to 1,200 people into that thing, have online bidding, have in-person bidding. We had 100 people work for us that day, selling these, uh, helping with, with runners, and we had licensed real estate agents. And in order, to, in, in order to streamline that all, we couldn't negotiate a monthly payment with every one of our people because you're selling the property every four minutes. Right. Like every four minutes, a property goes four to six that minutes. Sounds crazy, right? Jack. <laughs> it was. It was absolutely. It was a blast. It was an it absolute like a blast. blast. Right. We would sell about twenty-five properties an hour, and we would go for ten hours. Oh my gosh! With like bid, an auctioneer, bid assistance, the full thing. It's like, have you ever watched Speed Channel or was it Car or Speed Channel? Something with like the Barry Jackson car auction. Well, yes. It's the same thing, yes. just with land. Just with land. Right? Oh my god! So just with land, like five, six hundred, <laughs> eight hundred people there. And so on. And, and then when the recession came, actually it was a blessing in disguise because these auctions wouldn't work anymore. So what we did is we, 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 we transitioned our sales into online sales. And, by, and now uh, actually our, what we had created was, was a replicatable process because these auctions that we did, they used to cost us $200,000 in cash advertising. We, we would spend advertising on radio, television, newspaper, billboard, 60,000 flyers, you name it on there to make that thing happen. But then when we transition into online, online platforms like Facebook Marketplace are free. Right. So we were able to right. put dozens and hundreds of properties on there and then have our team go sell them. And we still do that, obviously. Now it's even a smaller team and, uh, and sell properties every single day. And at that moment, we also started teaching it because at that moment we started realizing, well, this somebody can replicate. 
The other one is going to be a little bit harder to replicate. But uh, what I wanted to say, uh, we also had to streamline the process of, 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 of the loans. So what we basically said, if we sell a bottom-end property, we don't want to finance a bottom-end property for 20 years. It's like a $5,000 property with $4,000 financing. You don't, want to, you don't want to finance that thing for 20 years. Otherwise, your monthly payment is going to be like $19. Right, right. It's not worth it. <laughs> So we put the limit in. We says that we will not finance. Uh, we not we we will not finance those cheap ones for more than three uh, three years maximum, which basically and put the minimum payment at at least at hundred bucks. So we never do loans for less than hundred bucks because it's not even worth the advertising, not even worth the, the administrative cost and so on. So a uh, hundred bucks, but a hundred thousand dollar loan or hundred fifty thousand dollar loan, if we do that for three years, then the monthly payment is five thousand dollars a month. That's too much for most people. So right. basically, you say like, well, if it's a large loan, we're going to finance this for all the way up to 18 years. And then we basically had certain put certain breakpoints in between that says like, if it's if we finance under ten thousand dollars, we do it for five years. But between three and ten, we finance it for five years. Between ten and twenty, we finance it for seven years. Between twenty and thirty, we finance it for ten years. Thirty to forty, we finance it for perhaps twelve years. Forty-two or to 75 or so, we finance it for 15 years. And over 75, we finance it for 18 years. And that basically what that means, it has kind of, it, it puts the monthly payments for almost any loan anywhere between 100 and about $800. And that's wow. a loan that we found that most people can afford, which again, helps us scale our business because we're not trying to find that unicorn that can afford a, a $3,000 a month payment. But instead, we are making the big payments affordable by stretching over a long time, which, by the way, adds hundreds of thousands of dollars in interest, which is very profitable. Uh, and the short ones, we're putting them into a short period of time so that, they're, that the payment at least is enough to make it worthwhile. That is super smart. I love the, systemat the systematizing of that. That's just brilliant. And it, it allows it to be consistent and replicatable. And that's, that's pretty awesome. So thanks for that bit of insight as well. Um, so in terms of acquisitions, I'm going to chat about that a little bit. Uh, how do you go about marketing to find these properties, to find owners who are, are motivated enough to sell <laughs> cheap enough so that way these properties do fit into your model? Right. Um, well, so it, it starts with uh, selecting areas that around the country that we want to do deals in. Again, it comes down to which kind of property you want to go after. You want to go in for lots, then you go into the bigger cities. You want to do their path of growth, you go around the bigger cities. And if you want to do uh, the rural, uh, the, the large acreage, more recreational one, then you pick something within one to three hours away from a big, big city. Because uh, the recreation, obviously, there's nobody or there's very few people that, that want to buy the land who live in the rural area because there's plenty of land for them to buy. So your buyers of a 40-acre parcel two hours away from a big city are the people who live in the big city. Right? Right. So therefore, you want to go uh, pick areas that are within weekend driving distance of those big cities. Um, and, and ideally... The city should be big so that there's a lot of people that could potentially buy that. So you have a lot of buyers there. So that's number one. You select that. Then the sec then the second thing is um, we we use uh, we use direct mail to contact them. And there's really two ways that we uh, teach this in a way uh, and that we do it ourselves. One of them is we send what we call out a neutral letter. So we don't usually go out directly with blind offers. I know other people who teach this in the in the country. They, they are a big proponent of the blind offer strategy. We like the blind offer strategy. And over time, a lot of our students and ourselves have transitioned to the blind offer strategy, but we use it as a one-two punch. And what I mean by that is that we first, and we go into a new area, we use what we call our neutral letter, which is a letter that asks people to contact us if they want to sell their property. And we do that in order to find out where is the big, where, where are the best pockets, where we can, where can we get the best deals, and where are the most deals available, instead of just blindly going into a neighborhood or into an area and just blanket them with some offers. And then, secondly, once we have done deals in that area and we are familiar with the demand, we're familiar with how many properties there are, we're familiar with the price levels. At that moment, doing a blind offer strategy is super simple. 
because now you just already know what you know. You know, if I, if, let's say if I go into an area and I get, and I, and I get a property that's, let's say again, worth 50 grand or, and, uh, or worth 80 grand, I get it for 30 and I go, or I get it for 25 and I go sell it for $60,000 and I have 25 people fighting over that property. Then the very next thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go back to that same area and I'm gonna blanket that area with blind offers to get more properties because now if these are similar properties also worth let's say 80k can i now go and do a blind offer with a straight up 35 or 40 thousand dollar offer of course i can because i know i got 24 people that missed out on that deal that are waiting for the next one willing to pay me 60. so again but i will do that so we do the what we call a neutral letter first and then we'll do the blind offer strategy second we don't currently engage in cold calling. I'm just not a fan of it. I don't want to maintain. I don't want to man maintain a a call center with people. I don't want to have to like. Uh, I don't want to deal with people. I I, I do who. I, it's just cold calling. is just not my thing. Period. And yeah. uh, and then we have a bunch of students who've done it, and a bunch of people who love doing it. And great, you can add it to it. We teach it because we have people in our universe who do it. And then we also texting. We have not called on cold. We don't do cold texting. Because it's just simply, um, it just simply gets you into way too many kind of like lawsuit situations of people like do not text kind of lists and stuff like that. But do we have people in our universe, in our group, in our environment, in our coaching group that do that? Sure, you can always do that and add to that. I just, from a teaching point of view, I don't want to teach it because if somebody gets sued, probably somebody for texting where they weren't supposed to be texting, guess what they're going to do? They're going to turn around and say like, well, Jack told me to do it. And, <laughs> yeah, like, yeah. and I don't want to get, I don't want to have a piece of that. I don't want to get into that. So <laughs> we have, we have information about it, but we say like, we say like, Hey, do not blame us if that ever happens. Got it. Got it. So one of the things that I. Plus actually I, that, if I may say that yeah. the last, the most important thing is. I mean, you guys know that the competition level in land is so much lower than it is in the house flipping side that you don't even need all those extra gimmicks to get deals. Right. What we instead do is we instead what we really focus on is on a really well-oiled follow-up system. So we only send like one letter, but then we but then from those people who call us back, we do follow up relentlessly on those. And that's a way that one of our students uh, sent out one time, he sent out 1,800 letters, he got one deal. But once he was done following up, he got he had to make that deal one deal into eleven deals. Wow, that's wow. the power of follow up. But money in the follow up and proof is in the pudding yeah. right there. That's incredible. And so, is that follow up <laughs> system mail as well, or is it? No, it's more it's more around uh, like voicemails. And in that case, now you have a now you have a relationship with the person. Now you can text them. Now you can uh, drip, uh, drop drop uh, ringless voicemails. Now you can create a a um, a follow up um, process in there. And then yes, you can add another another. It can add a second offer, a third offer, and that's kind of you can you can do this kind of elaborate system that that has a touch point every so often with them for multiple weeks and even months, and 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 it reactivates a lot more people from from the initial list of people. I love that. Getting as much juice as you possibly can out of those leads. So important. So one of the things that I wanted to chat with you about as well is uh, one of the, the many things I love about land flipping is the fact that this can be done virtually. And yes. so <laughs> one of the things that uh, that I came across or that you shared with us is that um, that, you know, of a case study of of how someone flipped 283 properties in the US while living in Spain. So can you talk a little bit about that? Because that sounds like virtual business heaven right there. Yeah, absolutely. And it is. So this gentleman, his name is Robin. He's now actually one of our coaches too. Uh, on the, so, but he is, uh, he's, he's done 283 deals in 2022. So this is not a story from many years ago. It's actually a funny thing. He started he, he discovered this. I mean, he heard this from us. Um, I actually did, went to Germany uh, and, and, and for one time ever, so far, never before, never before and never after so far, uh, I did a live event, teaching, three-day teaching event in Germany, teaching Germans how to do land deals from Germany in the United States. And this wow. guy's a German. He just happens to live in Spain. So he was sitting in the back of the room, and that was February 17, 2020. So it was just literally three weeks before, before the world shut down for COVID. Wow. Right? 
So he got he got into our coaching program, and then he was sitting in Spain where he lives in Mallorca on an island, beautiful island in the Mediterranean. He was sitting in Spain and building up his land business in the United States without ever having been into the in, in uh, set foot into the United States and without even being allowed to come into the United States because the borders were shut down. Right. That's what makes this really such an amazing case study because not only had he never been in the United States, he had actually not been allowed to come to the United States for the next year and a half or two years until the borders opened up again. And in that process, in that time period, he built up a very active and successful land flipping business in the United States by definition and by force virtual because he couldn't even come to the U.S. if he wanted to. <laughs> that's one of the most that's one of the most beautiful things uh, of that story. So so uh, in essence, now the, he is 283. He now built a nice team up. He has actually now he has a has a team in the United States, virtual, but still in the United States. He has a couple has several salespeople. He has several virtual assistants around the world in the Philippines and in different countries. So he's built up a nice team of I don't know how many people, but but now they're they're actually their goal this year is to be like at 600 or so lots. And uh, and still. He now comes every three, two or three months. He comes over to the U.S. and does a little tour. He actually found a girlfriend in the United States too. So, so now he comes over more often to meet his uh, his his love there. But uh, but it's still the business is still one hundred percent virtual. So perhaps what I can do is I can quickly lay out for you the the seven steps to make your business virtual. Would that would that I be? I would love useful? it. Yes. Okay. Please. Great. Yes. So the first thing you want to do if you want to build your business virtual is first thing number one is you want to have a virtual virtual phone system. Right. So what we use for us is we have and it's right here on my phone uh, on the very top we, we use Ring Central for our phone system. So right there, Ring Central. Uh, I'm not even signed in right now, but uh, just um, but but anyway. So Ring Central. Is a virtual phone system. It costs about with two with three different phone numbers, which you kind of need. Uh, it comes it comes to about sixty five or seventy dollars a month. So that's it. Now you don't want to use your own phone number because if you ever want to outsource it, if you ever want to have somebody else take any phone calls, if you ever want to build a team, you don't want to have to give up your phone number that you perhaps had for fifteen years already. Mine, I have I have had mine for twenty three years. My same phone number. So I don't want to have that. But if I have a virtual phone system as an app inside of my phone, I can then just simply transfer that phone number to somebody else. That's so great. that's it. That's number one. So therefore, three phone numbers. Number one, phone for the sellers to call you. Number two, phone for the sellers to come renegotiate with you. So you put the second phone number on your offer. So phone number one goes on the letter. Phone number two goes on your offer if they want to renegotiate. Phone number three is for your buyers to call you. So therefore, again, as you build a team, you can assign those phone numbers to different, different people. And now different people can do different parts of it while you sit back and let your business bloom. Beautiful. Right. So, so that's first thing. Second thing is a virtual, second is a virtual, virtual uh, mailbox. Mailbox. Now, why do you need that? Well, that's singular. We use a direct mail system. So we get sent out, sent people to letters to people. Now they call us back, they use the phone system. But if they, if, they, if they send an assigned agreement, for example, once you made the offers, well, where are they going to send the signed agreement to if, if, if Robin is in Germany? And they can't send, they're not going to put that in an envelope and pay international postage and, 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 and figure, what, uh, figure out what that is and send it to Germany. No, it needs to be a mail. You need to have a business presence in the United States. So we also have students in Canada that do this. We have students in, in Jamaica that do this. We have, we have uh, a student in Chile, South America, has done 49 deals last year from Chile. And I don't think they even came to the U.S. a single time either. So we have a whole bunch of those like that. So uh, Robin is just one example. So a virtual mailbox is a, is a mailbox that you pay something like $15 to $30 for, depending on much volume, can be a few bucks more, but usually it's in that price range, that, uh, that basically receives your mail for you, scans the envelope, and then you get an email notification that you got the mail. You log into the system, you see the envelope, and if you think it's junk, you say delete. And if you think it's something interesting, you see, click on it and ask them to open it. So then they go, and a few hours later, they have they they grabbed it, they open it, scanned it, and they upload it again. And right there, if it's an accepted contract, you can print it out at your home printer in Mallorca, Spain, in Chile, South America, print it out, scan it, and send it to the title company. You got a fully executed contract. 
Right? Wow. So again, virtual mailbox allows you to have a business presence in the United States, but, uh, and Brad says they're, uh, they're awesome. Physicaladdress.com is the one you, you, he uses. Yeah, they're, they're beautiful. There's lots of them. You just, you just Google uh, virtual mailbox and there's a ton of them uh, and then look at their pros and cons. Uh, you can have it in the Empire State Building. You can have it in Little Rock, Arkansas. You can have it wherever you want to have your presence be. It's also very useful if you do your business in the United States, basically. Even if you say like, oh, no, I have you ever thought about traveling for six weeks somewhere? Sure. If you have family in town, that's great. They can check the mail for you. But if you don't, virtual mailbox still solves the problem. You can now travel for three months and and still have access to your mail. So it's not just for international people, it's also for domestic people. That's the great. next one, uh, the next one is uh, we need, you need to get the data from somewhere. Well, the data is very simply, where do you get the data from? We use a CRM that are, we have 12 developers have developed an end-to-end -end CRM uh, system, a land flipping CRM system, a land flipping uh, deal flow system, and uh, has an integration to a, one of the best known and best uh, quality data sources. You can literally just download it right there, right? So you can do that from anywhere in the world too. Number four, we need a, uh, you need a mailing house, right? Because if you're a mailing house, that's supposed to be an I, mailing house, a mailing house sends the letters out for you. It's a direct mail-based system, right? The mailing house sends the letters out for you, Again, we use with we, we work with multiple mailing houses. Uh, two of them are actually also integrated with our software, so you can literally just download it and then pre and then upload it right there. And then go pay for the mailing, and you're done. And uh, and in that scenario, uh, and they mail it out for you. When it's obviously particularly important with Robin's case, if he sits in Spain, he's not going to go have his home printer print a thousand letters or ten thousand letters or whatever it is, and then send them out to the to the Spanish post office, and then it takes six weeks for that to arrive over in the US. During COVID, literally packages from Europe uh, and letters from Europe to, to the US and US to Europe took four months to arrive because oh. there was no more traffic. There were no more airplanes flying. If the right. countries are shut down and you only have like some very limited air, air traffic, the, the airplanes trap, uh, bring, the, they bring the mail. Like Lufthansa, British Airways, American Airlines, they always, carry some mail with them to different places. It's not like the US Postal Service doesn't have a fleet of airplanes. They use the commercial <laughs> airlines for that. So right. without, without that, mail takes forever to arrive. Obviously it's not feasible, it's more expensive anyway. So you send it out to a mailing house like that, they're sending out for you. By the way, you do the same thing for the offers. Both the letters as well as the offers can be sent out to the mailing house. Of course, you can also email offers. You can make offers verbally. You can do those kind of things. But then the next thing is you need a call center. Call center, because, because what happens if you are in Europe? In Europe, you are, you are nine hours ahead of Pacific time zone. So 5 p.m., people come from work in California. They go open their mailbox. They see a letter. They're just like, oh, let me call them. Well, that's 2 a.m. in Germany. Yeah. <laughs> or 2 a.m. In, in Spain. Uh, 2 a.m. in Spain. Not feasible. Plus, it's not a good idea, especially if you want to do volume, to take the phone calls. Because when you get, when you get when, using our method at least, when you, you send out a couple of thousand letters, you get phone calls. By the time <laughs> you miss one phone call, you, by one you answer one phone call, you miss three phone calls. By the time you answer, pick up the phone and listen to a voicemail, you miss another three phone calls. So, I mean, tell me how I know that because at the beginning, Michelle and I were taking our own phone calls. So wow. we, we, you were like catch, trying to catch up on those things. But a call center does it for you. We use a call center called landcalls.com. Landcalls.com is what we use. When you do that, they, they already know uh, that you're uh, coming kind of through us and, uh, and they already, they've set up hundreds of our students successfully. Then the next thing is you need a title company because now a uh, title company, and that obviously is the same thing as doing it in the, in the US. Because now you get it, uh, you send out your offer, uh, you, you, you have access, you figure out what these properties are worth, but you do that using a computer. Right? And a computer with internet access has the access to all of that from anywhere in the world. You may, if you need to access some government websites, some of them you can't access from outside of the country, you may need a VPN system for that. It's like another 10 bucks or 20 bucks to get a VPN. You access the US data websites through a VPN server. And so it looks like you have a, American IP address, even though you're sitting in Europe, 
that's about as, as much as this, but it's super simple. And then, then you make your offers, you send your offers out to the mailing house, the, they accept it, they send it to your virtual mailbox, you open it, you sign it, and then you send it to the title company. The next thing you do is you market these properties. You market through Facebook Marketplace. Does Facebook Marketplace, is, is Facebook Marketplace accessible from, from Spain? Yes. Is it accessible from, from Chile, South America? Yes. Is it accessible from Canada? Yes, right? So it's the same as doing it from the US. Uh, is land.com, landwatch.com, all these land selling websites, are they available from every, anywhere? So you do that from there. And then uh, the only thing you might need, and it's not mandatory, is also a bank account in the US. Let me see, that wasn't very pricky. Bank, bank account, uh, bank account, account in the US. And uh, that one is uh, obviously, it might be, let me just let me eliminate this. Be sure this is spelled really nice. There we go bank account in the US. And uh, for that, there is some online bank accounts available uh, that you can use. There's like, uh, but even, even that's not really 100% necessary because you can tell the title company to wire the funds to Spain, right? And you can tell the title company, you can also wire funds from Spain to the title company if you need to bring up your own cash and uh, which you rarely do and, and so on. But these are the seven things you need to have a 100% virtual business and run this business from anywhere. That is absolutely remarkable. I love that there's a virtual solution to any problem that you could think of in doing this business. So, so Jack, I want to kind of shift gears a little bit and, and find out from you, if you could go back and teach your younger self, what would you go back and say about this land business? Okay. So, Funny enough, somebody, two people asked me a very similar question in the last two weeks. So, it, uh, and then what I would say about the land business, I wouldn't, I wouldn't really change anything that we have done uh, at all. I would, I would have done exactly the same thing, exactly in the same speed and volume and, and anything like that. So uh, I'm very, very happy with the land business. But there's another aspect to the land business, and that is what we call it's it's a, it's the absolute perfect entry method into real estate. And so, for example, we don't just do land now. We do land. We have we do constant land flips. Just sold three properties, I think, a week ago or so, and then this week we haven't sold one, but we're looking. But there's a bunch of hot irons and hot properties that are probably going to sell in the next few days. So um, the thing that has land done is as uh, land flipping has done is has enabled us to number one, quit our jobs. Like we, we, we struggled forever figuring out how to work this, but once we figured it out, it took us 18 months to become millionaires. And now we have students that actually do this faster than us. So the second thing is it helped us live the life that we wanted to live because as immigrants in this country, we, had jobs with two weeks vacation. And if you have two weeks vacation, you have to make a choice. And particularly if your spouse is from another, from a third country uh, altogether too, you have to make a choice. What are we using our vacation for this year? Are we visiting your parents or my parents? That means in other words, you can only see your family every two years. And then once you do, you have no more time to even explore anything in the United States. And that's not the life we wanted to live. So land has given us the ability to spend six weeks a year in Europe. It has given up to you, and we could spend more there, but we, we now also have a daughter, she's 15 and has school, so we cannot, we have, our, our traveling is still restricted. We love traveling, that's our, that's our drug, right? We love traveling all over the world. My 15 year old has been in 20 different countries already. Wow. And so we, uh, we love, uh, so now we still have to go during, during the different vacation spots, like spring break and, and then all summer we go travel and fall break and Christmas break and so on and so forth. But, um, but it has given us the ability to do that. But there's something more to it because as you build your land business, you are learning about real estate. Even though we didn't have to touch a house for many, many years, we still learned about real estate. You still learn about how to clear title issues. You still learn about how, uh, how real estate works. You learn the language of real estate. You learn the terminology you, you get. And more than anything, your confidence grows. 
your confidence grows massively and you walk through life completely differently. So what, what real estate, what land flipping has done is given us all of that. But then I think we were too, we, we didn't scale up from there fast enough. And what I mean by that is in the, in the second area. So if you ask me, if I ask my, my younger self, what would I do different? I wouldn't do anything different in the land space, but I would use the knowledge from land and start building what we call legacy wealth much faster. Because again, 2008, we had $71,000 a month coming in our bank account in, in cash flow. Well, we started finally, when America was for sale, we started buying houses. Because we we're like, we don't need that money. We're sitting on $840,000 a year coming in in just cash flow that is not needed for anything. But we had no place to invest it because we didn't know anything else other than land flipping. Right? So we were otherwise, we were master land flippers, but not yet experienced in other areas. So, but then that, that's when we started. Then we started buying houses. We started buying houses like uh, in, in Phoenix and in, in other, in three different markets. And we bought a house portfolio of 45 houses and we just paid cash. And, and, and many of those we still own, which is great because now they have grown 10X in value. But then only a few years later, we started then uh, taking more money. Uh, like we, you, basically what we're saying is we're using money. Let's say uh, we're using land, like land, is our cash machine, right? So uh, I don't know if this is if this is a water fountain. Looks like a water water fountain or like a like a faucet. This is our cash machine. Like it's your cash machine, cash machine. This is your cash machine. It produces cash. The question is, what you do with that cash? And I think we were too. We we we're, we're we're doing really well. We own almost a thousand apartment units now. We have commercial property, we have a hotel, we have our car repair facilities, we have all kinds of stuff. Uh, we have land that we hold on to right in that path of growth, right? That, that in the next 20 years is gonna be worth, uh, e that we bought for $3,700, that each of those lots is gonna be, and we have like 15 of them, each of them are gonna be worth $500,000 in the next 20 years. I mean, all of that is all easy, fine, but what we, what we burn probably fast enough is to taste, take this and move this into, additional kind of real estate. For example, not necessarily single family rentals, but we are fans of multifamily. So now that's what we do. We continue doing land deals. We produce as much cash as we can from the land deals. And then we move that money into lots of multifamily properties. Just bought 57 units in Tampa in December. In November, we just bought 45 units in Phoenix in December. We have an active acquisition team on the multifamily side of things. And we are buying as much as we can, as fast as we can. Obviously, only the best deals that we can. That's why it's slow, because there's barely any good deals out there. But, uh, but basically, this is our cash machine. And that's what we call asset allocation. We allocate the money that we make. We move it over here. And we are generating what we call, what's called generational wealth, generational cash flow, that, uh, and, and legacy wealth for us, for our daughter, and for her future children whenever she may have those in the uh, hopefully not too near future because she's only 15. <laughs> right. Yeah, well, that's remarkable. I mean, land, such an incredible vehicle for, for building uh, cash. And then the way that you described how, how you put that to use in, to build generational wealth, it's just, it's just really inspiring to see. So if, uh, if you had to, to name what would be your biggest passion or um, goal that you'd like to achieve at this point in your life oh my biggest goal is to create ten thousand millionaires like Love this that. we we like we we have now like financially speaking we're we're blessed we're great we have a we have a place in in hawaii uh we have a we have a place in sedona arizona we live in a in our dream home um we, 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 we're spending weeks and months uh, traveling. I mean, life can't really get any better from a material kind of point of view for us. We are set up, I mean, with a thousand apartments that spit out cash flow left and right. Many of those we own, some of those we own with investors, many of those we own without investors. So they're truly just spitting out cash for us. And uh, so now I'm not saying that to brag that I'm basically at some point of time when you hit your own financial goals, and I didn't understand that until it happened to me. And that is like, uh, I was always like saying, like when I saw somebody teach, they're like, why are they teaching? What, are, what, what, 
what what what's going on? Why are they doing this? And 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 some people teach just to make extra money, but but the but when we teach, when this came up, this concept of teaching is when we hit a whole bunch of these markers. And at some point of time, when I, when I was when we were financially set for life, I was 37 years old. Wow. What do you do when you're 37 years old? <laughs> When you've retired you just, at 37. You just go, go for the next thing, go for the billion, go for the thing. I mean, what's, what's the point? At some point of time, what you'll find if you ask people that, that, are, that are sharing a lot of things is you get to a point where it's just like, well, we got something here that the world really needs to know about. We got something here that really can help others. And yes, is it a business or a coaching business? Yes. Does it make us a little bit money? Yes, much less than what people think it does. Uh, but but the point is, has it changed people's lives? Yes, we have created already over a thousand millionaires and we have a goal to create 10,000 millionaires. And my vision is really to sit down in, in Hawaii at our beautiful place on Maui and sit on the balcony when I'm really old and I really don't wanna do stuff anymore. And it's a drink a nice glass of wine and basically say like, like cling, yes, I, we made a dent in the universe. There's 10,000 families running around here that uh, basically they have built their business to a million dollar level. And because of that, and that really means that there's probably another 50,000 that have built it to the six figure level. Uh, but that really means all these families' lives has been changed for multiple generations. Because it really means that if somebody built their business to, for the, to the seven figure level, their kids have a completely different life that they otherwise would have. Their grandchildren are in a trajectory to who knows, become American president of the United States of America that would have otherwise not been possible. And those grandkids, they won't remember my name anymore. Those kids probably won't remember my name. And that's not what it's about. That's why we call it the land profit generator, not the Jack Bosch program, right? It's not about aggrandizing Jack Bosch. It's about leaving an impact. So that's, that's the phase I'm in right now. We really don't need to teach. We don't need to do these things. We're really well set, but it's what, what juices me, what excites me. I mean, what, what, I, I mean what, I, what we talked about right now in various parts of this presentation, I've probably given a thousand times, but I'm just, about as, just as excited about it right now as I'm the first time I gave it. Yeah, I can tell you just light up when you talk about it and that's so refreshing and it's so exciting and inspiring to see. And I, I absolutely love that impact that you're making and that, that giving back and, and helping to improve so many people's lives through land and through wealth is just absolutely incredible. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Jack, I wanna thank you so much for giving to us today. Uh, is, there, is there any way that we can give back to you right now? What resources or connections are you looking for currently? Uh, well, I, first of all, uh, for, thank you very much. So um, we have, I wrote down already two names here. Like we have, uh, we had uh, was like um, Steve and and and, and Tonsha uh, Hokanson. Uh, would love to, to hook up with you guys. Perhaps uh, um, many of our students might need your bookkeeping services. I would love to hook up uh, to to connect with with Brad uh, on the land lending. There might be. I'm sure there would be lots of our, our students might be interested in 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 lending from you guys. So perhaps you guys can connect us. That would be a great connection. If there's anyone else. Here on the road, we're always looking for more service providers that can help help our team member, uh, our students uh, become even more successful. And 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 so yeah, would love would love to talk to you guys about any of that. And 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 on the other hand, if any one of you guys uh, ever want to come with us, you can always follow me on Instagram and on uh, it's Jack Bosch, and it's on Facebook, it's Jack Bosch, and then on a TikTok, it's Jack Bosch, and, and I don't know where else I am, but uh, that's probably where I am. Awesome. So we will definitely be including. Uh, your your social media handles in there uh, in the show notes as well. Jack, thank you so much for sharing your time. You've been so thank generous. You. And, thank you for uh, having me. Thank you guys so much again for joining us. Again, every single Thursday, we have these calls where we interview a land flipper that is just absolutely crushing the game. And this week, Jack, you've been awesome. So thank you so much. Thank uh, you very much for having me. Absolutely. Everyone have a wonderful week. Looking forward to seeing you on the next call. Until then, be great and talk to you soon. Bye-bye. If you're interested in hearing from other six and seven figure land flippers about how they've built and run their businesses, then check out my group, Only Land Fans, where I do a live interview each week inside the group. You can grab that link at the description below. Until then, be great, have a great week, and catch you in the next one.